Thank you, Kate. It's so great to be here. Thank you all for being here. Hello to everybody in the foyer. I've been inspired by Richard Gill's talk, so I'm going to start with a song, but I am not going to sing. It's okay. One of my favourite singer-songwriters, Regina Spector, wrote an ethereally beautiful song called Samson. I don't know if anyone knows it. And it retells the biblical story of Samson and Delilah. And Delilah sings, Beneath the sheets of paper lie my truth. And it's a passionate truth because Samson and Delilah are lovers. And it's true, she did cut his hair. That stuff about bringing the columns down, nah, never happened. Didn't happen at all. And the reason we don't know this story is because, Delilah says, because the history books forgot about us and the Bible didn't mention us, not even once. I just love Spectre's playful seriousness here. I love this voice of Delilah ringing out from the dusty, musty pages of the history books. And I love the way she takes on the Bible as though it's a kind of really unreliable tabloid. It's a great song. I'm a historian. I work on the early history of Sydney. And I can tell you that sometimes a voice like Delilah's really does ring out from under the pages of the history books, the way hers does in the song. These are the voices from beneath. They tell us what's really going on. They're compelling. They make my heart beat faster. Some of them haunt me. If we could be on the edge of Sydney Harbour somewhere around Mossman or, or Ball's Head at the end of 1790 and we could listen, above the sound of the waves, you would hear the voices of Eora fisherwomen in their canoes out there on the water and they would be singing the fishing songs and keeping time with their paddles. But there's a longboat out there too, and it's full of white men. And they're shouting, they're shouting endlessly, Ban along! Ban along! The fisherwomen can hear them. They think it's hilarious. And they mimic the white men in their higher, thinner voices. Ban along! Ban along! The white men can hear them, and they know they're being mocked. Let's go into the early town now, the camp, about 1800, a few years later, 10 years later. We're going over the log bridge, over the tank stream. We're heading up the ridge, and we're going to look down into the beautiful bay of Woolloomooloo. And this is what it looked like, a beautiful kind of bush-backed bay, um, still very bucolic, and of course, as you do, a classical mansion sitting on a cleared rise. This houses belongs to the, pa uh, the Palmer family, and they have just scored themselves a real prize, a skilled convict servant. She's a woman. She's a convict, it's true. She's just off the boat, but her days as a cross-dressing horse thief are over. <laughs> her name is Margaret Catchpole, and she is skilled. That's why she's a prize. She's a skilled dairy woman. She's a horsewoman. She's a very intelligent person, and she has a great sense of humour, and she's a great observer of life. This is her. Now, we could be peering in at the kitchen window of that house to see her bending over at the table, writing her first letter home. Now, she's not a very good writer. We should be thankful for that because Margaret Catchpole wrote as she spoke. So her letters meander around like an easy conversation, like she's talking to her relatives and friends back home and to us. And her spelling is so very, very adventurous and brave <laughs> that you can hear her Suffolk accent in what she writes. And I've actually got a copy of her letter here, which I'm going to read to you a little of. You'll notice it's not in an envelope because they didn't have envelopes. They used to just fold them over and fix them with sealing wax. So that's what I've done for you. This is from her first letter, which you can see here up on the screen also. And it's about when she arrives. As I was going to be landed, on the left hand of me, it put me in mind of a cliff, both the housen and likewise the hills, so as to put me in very good spirits indeed, seeing a place so much like my own native home. 
It is a great deal more like England than ever I did expect to see, for here is garden stuff of every kind. The gardens are very beautiful indeed, all planted with geraniums, and they run up seven and eight foot high. Geraniums? Gardens? A place like home? Uh, excuse me, I thought this was supposed to be hell on earth, you know, the gulag. She goes on uh, to tell Dr. Stevens something she thinks will interest him. The crops of wheat here is very good in this country, for it produces 40 bushels per acre. It is a very bountiful place indeed, for I understand that them that never had a child in all their lives have some after they come here. <laughs> now, Margaret writes about the beauty of the country quite a bit in her letters. In fact, every letter has these descriptions in it, and even more about this miracle that everybody's talking about, that women who come to Sydney who have never been able to have a child before become pregnant and have babies. Well, you might be thinking, hmm, that's all very well. A few human interest stories to make dry old history a bit more interesting. <laughs> that's wrong. These stories change history. These stories are history. These stories show us what's really going on. They invite us into what the great historian Greg Denning called the past's own presence. The past's own present. That's the time when people didn't know what was going to happen. It's the time when things were undecided, when things were still uncertain and exciting. Imagine we're back down on the harbour with the Eora fisherwomen. Who are they? They are the great Eora fisherwomen of early Sydney. They are the mistresses of this harbour. They rule these waves. Their skills in canoeing and diving and fishing and swimming are absolutely extraordinary. They can, they can paddle these little bark canoes, which were very wobbly, um, with a child in the front, a child in the back, baby at the breast, fishing, fire in the front, cooking fish through the largest surf. So they, you know, the British sailors were absolutely in awe of them. They take children out in these canoes from uh, soon after birth. And so the children grow up on the water. And so that means that the rhythm of the paddles and the rocking of the canoes and the swell of the waves must have been just as familiar to them as the solidity of the earth or their mother's heartbeat. The girls learn to line fish as they grow from their mums and their aunties and their grandmas. They learn the fishing song from the fishing places. They learn how to hone a hook from the cheek of a turban shell. They learn how to burly with chewed cockle. They learn how to snare and fish, snare and, and hook a fish. But there's more to this than fishing, more even than that. The women are the main food providers for the Eora families, and uh, so they control the food supply. And anthropologists have argued, and there is a lot of reason to believe this, is that in the coastal areas where women control the food supply, they can challenge the social and cultural dominance of men. So polygyny is reduced. Women and children can attend male ceremonies and rituals, which they do in Sydney. And it also means that women have their own spiritual, probably secret and sacred uh, teaching places and life. And so Sydney would have had this female Eora geography. We've lost that geography, but I'm sure that it's centred on the harbour, their harbour. But why are they mimicking the white men in the canoes who were shouting for Benelong that day in 1790? Well, we're so often told or we assume that the continent here, and New South Wales, became white space and under British law as soon as the first white feet sloshed onto the shores at Botany Bay. But this isn't true, because two years after, even two years after um, that happened, the camp's been set up at Sydney Cove. All the land around the camp and all the waterways, they're still Aboriginal land. Unarmed whites that go into that country they go into it at their peril, and the Aboriginal people do not come in to this town. They avoid it. There are no communication, um, there's no links of communication between the two groups. The camp is an insignificant speck 
on the rim of a vast Aboriginal continent. Now, this actually um, tells us a lot about how the whites are thinking because they, um, they are very disturbed, they find this eerie, they don't know what to do, and so they take drastic action. They kidnap a warrior to force open communication, and they kidnap Ben Along, who will come up on the screen in a minute. There he is. This is Ben Along. This man was brilliant. He was a very promising protege. He learnt English fast. He wore their clothes. He, um, he toasted the king. But after he'd learnt everything he could, he left them, jumped over the fence at government house and went back to his people. Oh, no. They were back at square one after all that effort. So they get into the boats and they row out into the harbour and they call his name endlessly to the impassive grey-green shore. And they hear the women's voices coming back to them, mimicking them and laced unmistakably with laughter. And so we know who holds the upper hand here in Sydney Harbour in 1790. Well, what about Margaret Catchpole? How's she going? She's going very well, thank you. Ten years after she gets here, she, she's arrived in Convict in Chains. Ten years later, she has a little farm on the Hawkesbury. She's a, a nurse and midwife in her little community at Richmond, and she's highly esteemed by the people there. And she can't help boasting just a little to the people back home. They think of me very well. They cannot do without me. And it's probably true. Now, what do her letters tell us? Two things absolutely shine in Margaret's letters. One is that men are irrelevant. <laughs> They're just not there. They're really distant figures, you know. And what the letters tell us is this is, is the way that the women are building this colony. Now, how does that change history? Well, you know that most historical accounts leave the women out as though they didn't do anything, as though they're just passive dependents, that... Um, or they, those, you know, damned nuisance whores. Uh, but Margaret tells us the truth. Women are running pubs. This is my favourite picture of a convict woman. Um, they're smoking pipes. They, um, they, they set up shops. They have families. They, they make and mend clothing. Very particular about the clothing. Uh, they dance. They drink. They sing. They fight. And they flirt and they make very cool-headed decisions indeed about who they will marry or if they'll marry at all. Margaret Catchpole says that she was not for marrying. And she's one of the special women in, early, in the early colony because she is there at the hour of greatest human need. She brings babies into the world. She, la she, she nurses the sick. She lays out the dead before they're farewelled and, and laid to rest. What price such comforts? And so the letters tell us loud and clear that you can't have a colony without women, and you certainly can't have a nation without women. Now, the other great strand in her letters is that she writes about country all the time. It's capriciousness, the wild hailstorms, the floods, terrible floods that she endured. But she also writes about its intoxicating beauty, the, the wheat fields all in ear, the great bounty of the peach trees, so laden with fruit that the limbs touch the ground, and the babies, always with the babies. Again, how does that change history? Well, we are constantly told that the early settlers hated the local environment, that they felt alienated by it, and, and that they attacked it, and that they thought everything was upside down and wrong. And we're told that the environment in turn hated them and it tried to kill them and reject them and withered their bodies to husks. Not true. The settlers reveled in the local environment. This is what Margaret Catchpole's letters are telling us. They celebrated its bounty. They feasted. Uh, they loved the climate. They said, oh, we feel alive in this climate. In England, we feel dead. Here, we feel alive. <laughs> That's a true quote. Um, they celebrate the bounty of the fish and the oysters and the, the wild fowl that they feast upon. They collect nature and uh, they paint it, as you see here, and they wrote poetry about it, celebrating it. And most of all, they watch in wonder as women 
sick and starved and old beyond their years, become pregnant and swell with new life. What a place they had come to. The eminent historian Alan Atkinson writes about the voices of history too. And he says, the past is not only a foreign country, but a region thick with competing voices. And we who hunt among them are like half deaf people at parties. Humbling but true. It's true. The voices I've talked about today ha have often, so often, been drowned out by louder, more insistent, more triumphant voices of empire and authority. They're the ones who write the histories. But cup your ear. Listen to the background hubbub. And in a quick silver moment, you may catch what lies beneath and what is really going on. Thank you. <laughs>